Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this series, we're going to be demystifying property wrappers. These are types that manage access to properties. They're essentially delegates. But what makes property wrappers so special in Swift is that when we use one as an annotation like this, and we will be, what we're saying is that we would like access to the property counter to be managed by an instance of state. But we don't want to know anything about it and we want to treat counter as if it isn't being managed at all. Now, that's great, but it is a bit magical and can lead to confusion as to what's really going on, as well as a sense that there's more going on than there actually is. In the case of state and binding, for example, it can appear that their use as property wrapper annotations has a hand in the state management itself, since they're always used in this way in the coding examples that we see. In this episode, we're going to separate these two concerns, that of the convenience of property wrapper annotations and that of the state management. We're going to do this by removing annotations from a view hierarchy. In the process, we're going to learn about what property wrappers are but just as importantly, we're going to learn about what they are not. So, now that I've teed up the episode nicely, let's drive it down the middle of the fairway. Right, here we've got what might be considered a stereotypical implementation of a counter in SwiftUI. I've got a state annotation on line 7, which is giving us a counter. I'm outputting the value on line 11, and then on line 12, I'm passing in the projected value of that counter into the counter updating button, which is being received on line 19 by the app binding counter property. I am then updating the counter on line 24 when someone clicks the button. This is not a tutorial on how to use state and binding in SwiftUI for state management, although this example pretty much epitomizes their use. If you'd like more in-depth tutorials on that topic, I'll link to a couple in the description below. If we scroll down, you can see that all I've got on this thing, other than the mechanics of updating the counter, is a bit of styling to make it look a little bit more interesting. So let's go back up to our view, and now what we can do is start removing these annotations. In order to do that, we need to understand the structs that actually define these property wrappers. So let's take a look at the definition for the state property wrapper. And the first thing you'll notice is that this struct is defined using the property wrapper annotation, allowing this struct to be used as an at state annotated property. And when used this way, gives us several things for free. The next thing you'll notice is that it has two initializers, one that takes a wrapped value argument and one that takes an initial value. When you initialize state in the way we've done on line seven, behind the scenes, it is creating an instance of state using the initializer that takes a wrapped value. If this specific initializer has not been defined, the line where we set our counter to zero would not compile. That being said, it is worth noting that an initializer with that signature is not a requirement for property wrappers, as in the case of binding, for example. So that's the first thing that happens behind the scenes. The second thing we get is access to the only requirement of a property wrapper type, and that is the wrapped value property. After all, what good is a property wrapper if it didn't wrap a property? And it is this that stores the actual property that we annotated. In our case, this is the counter int. So whenever we access counter, as we do on line 11, we are actually accessing the wrapped value. And it is the getters and setters on the wrapped value property that perform the logic contained in any particular property wrapper. Notice that in the case of state, the setter is non-mutating. This will be a useful bit of information later on, as well as in the next episode, where we're going to be observing changes in state. The third synthesized property we get is regarding the projected value. As far as property wrappers are concerned, this can be anything at all. But in the case of the state property wrapper, it is a binding. This projected value is accessed using the dollar prefixed version of our property. And you can see that we are making use of this on line 12. This is why state and binding are inextricably linked when it comes to state management in SwiftUI. As with the initializer that takes a wrapped value argument, this is also not a requirement of property wrappers. But without it, the dollar prefix will throw a compilation error. The final thing that is synthesized for us is access to the property wrapper itself. We haven't used that in our code at this point, but this is accessed using the underscore prefix version of our property. Now, don't worry if a lot of this is quite confusing to you. That's to be expected if you're not that familiar with property wrappers. As this series continues, you'll become more familiar with these concepts. And in the fourth episode, we'll be building our own property wrapper, which will really solidify these principles for you.
So if you haven't already, now might be a great time to subscribe because I'd hate for you to miss out on all that property wrapper goodness. So we know that the counter is the wrapped value. So surely I could just say wrapped value. Surely I could do that. Well, I can't actually do that. The reason is because counter is essentially an alias to the wrapped value itself, which is an int. And an int does not have a wrapped value property. What we need to do is use the other thing we learned about, which is the underscore synthesized property, which gives us access to the struct itself. If instead of counter dot wrap value, I say underscore counter wrap value like that, then this will all compile and work as it did before. So I can click this and we get an incrementing counter. Beautiful. We can do the same thing on line 12. So instead of dollar prefix, I can use the underscore prefix. I can say underscore projected value. And this will again work just as it did before. So there we are pulling back the curtain slightly on what's going on here, but we can go much further than this. We don't need the at state annotation at all. Now we know that a state property wrapper takes in a value in its initializer behind the scenes, but we can do it explicitly. So instead of at state private var counter, we can actually initialize our property like this. Get rid of the at state there. And we can say that it's equal to the state. And we have two options here. These are functionally the same, except the wrapped value exposes an implementation detail of property wrappers, which is why I believe they want you to use initial value when initializing a state like this. So let's be good developers and do that. Initial value, zero. So now what we've got on our hands is the same thing as we had before, we're just doing it without an annotation. And you can see on line 11 and 12, the compiler is starting to complain a bit because counter is no longer an alias to wrap value, but counter is instead the actual state. So I don't need the underscore to expose it and I can get rid of both of them. So I can go down here and just get rid of that. And now if I resume, I can click this. And again, this is precisely what we had before except now we don't get the syntactic sugar that we had when we were using the at state annotation. That is what it gives us. It means we don't have to do this, right? We have a cleaner interface, but that's the only thing that the annotation gives us. The annotation itself is not responsible for any of the state management that we get, okay? So now that we've done it to the state, let's also do it to the binding. Let's get rid of that annotation as well. On line 19, we're not actually initializing a new binding. All we're doing is assigning the one from this state projected value on line 12. So instead of initializing one, all I need to do is change the type of the property. So I go down to this property, I remove the at binding, and I change the type to binding with a type of int. And now of course it's complaining on line 24. And the reason is because Counter used to be an alias to the wrapped value of binding, which was in turn the wrapped value of the state, which is an int. But now we're trying to add one to a binding, which doesn't work. It's not an int. So we need to get the wrapped value out of the binding, which is an int. So I go down here and say wrapped value. And now when I resume, we can go over to our button and it works just as it did before. We've got no annotations, but we've still got the state management that we know and love. And if you really want to blow your minds, you can actually go to your counter and change it to a let. And then if I resume, this will work just as it did before. And the reason for this is because neither the state nor the binding are being mutated when you change the wrapped value inside them. Because if you remember from the definition of state, the setter on the wrapped value is non-mutating. And the same thing goes for the wrapped value in the binding property wrapper. But we can go even further than this because we can recreate almost completely the magic of the at state annotation. The first thing we need to do to do that is rename the counter to underscore counter. This then gives us the underscore for accessing the state property wrapper itself. Now we need to add a couple of properties. I'm going to say that the counter is an int and I'm just going to return 
the underscore counter wrapped value. So now I can just use counter. It's not liking the projected value, so I can add another property, private var. I'm going to say underscore dollar counter because we're not allowed to use dollars for the first character because they are explicitly reserved for synthesized accessors as we have when we're using annotations. So that is a binding of type int. And all I do is say underscore counter projected value. And now that I've got the projected value, I don't need to explicitly refer to it on line 20. So I can get rid of that and use underscore dollar instead. There we are. So now we have all the magic of the annotations, but without the annotations. And if I resume, this will all work exactly as it did before. As you can see, using annotations gives us a lot of stuff for free. But I hope by now you can see the separation between the property wrapper implementation and the annotation that gives us all that lovely syntactic sugar on top. But now what we're going to do is go back to our original code and look at a slightly more complex example because there's another thing that I think we might find quite interesting. I've left the binding as it was, but I've changed state back to the annotation. This time we've got a view state that has a counter inside it. So we've got a wrapped counter on our hands and I just wanted to show you how it works with a slightly more complex bit of state. As you can see, we initialize it in the same way, except instead of an int, this is a view state on line 11. And when we access the counter, we access the counter within the view state. Let's do exactly what we did before. We're going to say that the view state is a constant. We'll say that it's a new state with an initial value of view state that we had before. So now we've got our state. And we need to change lines 15 and 16 in order for this thing to compile. It's only saying there's a compilation problem on line 16, but I know better. So let's fix the one that it's actually complaining about. It cannot find dollar view state in scope. This is understandable because we're no longer using the at state annotation. So in order to access the binding, we need the projected value from view state. So instead of dollar, we say view state projected value dot counter. Now it's going to show you that there's a problem on line 15 as well, because view state doesn't have a counter property. It has a wrapped value, which is of type view state. So in order to get the counter out, I need to access the wrapped value and then access the property on that. Wrapped value dot counter. At this point, I can resume and everything works as you'd expect. One, two, three, or five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. And this is the interesting part. How does that work? Line 16 is where the magic is happening here. I'm getting the projected value out as if I had used the dollar prefix, okay? So I've got the projected value, which is a binding. So how am I allowed to call counter on it? How does that make sense? How does it know about the counter property inside my view state in order to return a binding of an int? To understand this, we need to look at the definition of binding. And here we can see the dynamic member lookup annotation. And if we look at the subscript that backs that up, we can see that it takes in a writable key path that is specifically typed to the type of the binding. So the binding can then wrap access to key paths that exist within our type in further bindings. I'm not going to go into any more detail about dynamic member lookup because it's covered far more extensively in other tutorials that I will again link to in the description. But if you were wondering how it performed this miracle, that is how. We can even have a little bit of fun with this because it turns out that the projected value of a binding just returns itself. So I could actually say projected value dot projected value dot counter dot projected value dot projected value <laughs> okay and that will work exactly as it did before look at this so i hope this has helped clear up some of the mystery involved in property wrappers and the state and binding property wrappers themselves in the next episode we're going to look at how to listen to changes in those states so join me for that it's going to be brilliant if you're liking it so far then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more because there's a lot more of this kind of thing on its way if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.